right, let's get started with the last session. Uh, personal notes, I'm happy to say that this next to last day of Cassie is the first day that I sort of felt my brain melt down. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this talk sort of through that lens. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, very good. Um, <laughs> so last time we talked about this theorem due to Lucher and Mack that the correlation functions of a reflection positive conformal field theory can be analytically continued to Whiteman distributions on the Lorenzian cylinder. Um, and uh, I just wanted to make a couple more comments about the geometry of the Lorenzian cylinder. Um, so first of all, uh, this embedding space coordinate gives um, most of the information about where we are on the Lorentzian cylinder, um, but this just parameterizes a copy of um, uh, of S1 cross SD minus 1. Um, and so the actual Lorentzian cylinder is given by the universal cover of this. So to say, so to say where we are on the Lorentzian cylinder, we need to give um, the embedding space vector and also how many times we shift by 2 pi in this direction. Um, and so the Lorenzian conformal group um, is the orthogonal group in this space, SO d comma 2, um, but uh, not quite. Uh, the problem is that, so this thing contains a maximal compact subgroup, SOD cross SO2. And this SO2 uh, consists of precisely the shifts uh, in sigma. Um, and the problem is that um, even though uh, this space is um, invariant under a 2 pi shift of sigma, the actual physical space where the theory lives is not. Um, so this is not the appropriate group for describing um, the symmetries of the theory because um, it contains an element that, well, because the element that shifts sigma by 2 pi is trivial in this group, but non-trivial in the theory. So the correct Lorentzian conformal group Um, is the universal cover of this group, SO d comma 2. And the effect of the universal cover is essentially just to decompactify this SO2. Um, uh, and uh, this is the thing that acts naturally on this space. Okay, So that was something that I wrote um, in the first lecture, the Lorentzian conformal group, um, and hopefully that explains what I mean. Um, and the other comment I wanted to make about uh, the geometry here that we'll use in a second um, is, um, um, is uh, about a natural operation um, on uh, the Lorenzian cylinder. Um, so let's suppose that we have a point here uh, in some Minkowski patch. Um, from this point, we can imagine sending light rays in all directions. Um, so we send a light ray in this direction and a light ray in this direction. Um, but this picture is periodic, so the two sides of the diagram should be identified because we're on a cylinder. So this thing emerges out here, and you see that the light rays um, intersect at, um, at another point. And in fact, if you have light rays going in, in d dimensions, so this is a two-dimensional picture for simplicity, but in d dimensions, if you had light rays going out in all directions, they would all intersect um, at another point. And that point um, I'll call uh, Tp. So T is sort of a translation um, from one Minkowski patch to the next Minkowski patch on the Lorenzian cylinder. Um, and the relationship, and T is, a, a, um, is a, a, an operation that uh, commutes with the conformal symmetries. Okay? So the way I described the relationship between P um, and Tp was a conformally invariant thing because the, the paths that the light rays take are, um, uh, are the same in any uh, conformal structure. Okay? Um, and in terms of the embedding space variables, um, the relationship here is that, um, so if we start on one side of the cylinder, then we move up, um, then sigma increases by pi to go here, and we also go to the diametrically opposite side of the cylinder. So this operation, T, acts on xl um, to give minus xl, okay? because we shift by pi in all the sigmas, and we take this unit vector on the, on the sphere to minus the same unit vector. Okay? 
Good. All right. Um, so that's uh, the geometry on which uh, Lorentzian conformal field theory lives. And now I want to start talking about some interesting observables um, that um, have lots of uh, important physical applications um, and are very difficult to make sense of in Euclidean signature. Um, and the observables that I'll talk about are uh, null integrated operators. So for example, um, if we have some uh, operator O, we can integrate it along a null line. So in light cone coordinates, this would be an integral dv O with some indices. So here, it's a, it's a spin j operator. It has j indices. Um, and we'll stick it at u equals 0 at some position v and some transverse position y. And here, I'm using um, light cone coordinates. where um, u is t minus uh, x1, v is t plus x1, um, and y is some transverse direction. Um, and so uh, one important example of this kind of null integrated operator um, is when O is the stress tensor. Um, and then this becomes the so-called average null energy operator. Um, which we'll talk about in detail a little bit later. Okay, um, So uh, these null integrated operators are not something that you can define in a nice way in Euclidean signature. They, they're really intrinsically Lorentzian objects. Um, but they have some really nice properties. And um, to start understanding their properties, I want to talk about um, how they transform under conformal transformations. So it's a good idea in a CFT to, for whatever objects you're looking at, um, understand uh, how they play with the symmetries. Um, so to do that, uh, I'm going to develop a little bit, uh, a little bit more technology. Um, so first, we're going to talk about uh, index-free notation. Um, and this will start out as a mathematical convenience, um, but will end up uh, taking on a life of its own, uh, as we'll see. Um, so the idea of index-free notation, by the way, did, did uh, anyone talk about index-free notation in any of the other lectures? No? OK. Um, all right, so the idea with index-free notation is suppose we have some operator. And for simplicity, I'll take it to be a traceless symmetric tensor. Um, then it's very convenient to uh, contract the indices with a polarization vector. So for example, I can introduce a vector z and contract the first index here. Um, and because O is symmetric, I can use the same polarization vector for all the indices without losing any information. Um, and furthermore, because O is traceless, I can actually set um, take z to be null, and I don't lose any information. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Um, and so the idea is that this defines an object um, O of x comma z. Um, it's a function of position and also this polarization vector um, z. Um, and um, uh, my claim is that you can go back and forth between this object and the underlying tensor um, at will. Um, and so uh, um, this is just another way of encoding this tensor. Um, and as an example, let's suppose that we had let's suppose that we had some two index um, traceless symmetric tensor f mu nu, and suppose we knew um, what its contraction with z's was. Suppose that this is equal to uh, v dot z squared for some v. Then um, exercise show that uh, f mu nu is uniquely fixed um, to be v mu uh, v nu minus 1 over d um, delta mu nu. Okay? So the idea is that this is the unique traceless symmetric object such that when you contract it with z, you get this thing. Okay. All right. Um, so by construction, um, O of x comma z 
um, is homogeneous in Z with degree J. So by looking at the homogeneity in Z, we can read off um, what the spin of this object is. Um, and finally, another point is that um, uh, if O transforms like a primary operator, then we can write its transformation property nicely in terms of X and Z. So the definition of a primary uh, in this notation, well, us the usual definition is that if you conjugate by some symmetry, um, then uh, two things happen. Uh, first of all, you get a uh, rescaling factor um, that depends on uh, the dimension of the operator. Um, and second of all, the indices of the operator get rotated in some way. Um, and in this case, that just means that the polarization vector gets rotated. Okay, we're here omega uh, and r um, are, omega is the rescaling and R is the rotation, the local rescaling and the local rotation associated with some conformal transformation. Okay, and you may have, hopefully Slava wrote a transformation rule like this um, in index full notation and this is just a, a, another way of writing that same transformation law. Okay, um, now so one point about, um, one point about writing things in this way um, that might seem a little strange at the moment, but will hopefully become clear in a second, um, is that in this language, it's possible to describe operators with non-integer spin. Um, what we do, um, so I should have said this. Um, so first of all, if we have an integer spin operator, then O of x comma z is polynomial in z. Um, for non-integer spin, by which I, I really mean non-negative non integer spin. All we have to do um, is, so we have an object like this. It should satisfy the exact same transformation law in order to be a primary. It should be homogeneous with degree j, but it doesn't have to be a polynomial anymore. Okay, so we could imagine such a thing. You might not be sure why we should imagine such a thing, and I'll explain that in a second. But certainly, it's possible mathematically to describe a non-integer spin primary in this way. Okay, and now the fact that this thing is so, the only difference is that it's not a polynomial. The fact that it's not a polynomial in Z means that we can no longer do this procedure of going from the function of z to an underlying tensor. Okay, um, uh, so these non-integer spin operators do not have an underlying tensor, which is good because how would we be able to write a non-integer number of indices? Um, but nonetheless, we can describe them uh, in this language. Okay, um, the the last bit of technology. Um, that we need is uh, lifting operators to the embedding space. And uh, Slava, did Slava talk about this? Did he do the case with spinning operators? No. Okay, so this will be a little bit new, but you guys saw scalars, so hopefully that will help. So the idea is that if we have an operator um, with spin, um, uh, then we can lift it to the embedding space. And in the embedding space, it will become a function of two embedding space vectors. Um, so these are going to be um, embedding space vectors. And here, the little versions of them are just uh, um, positions in Minkowski space. Um, and again, x is going to play the role of position, and z will play the role of a polarization vector. Um, but uh, if we have a um, we, we now have a d plus two dimensional polarization vector and that's more degrees of freedom than we should have to describe um, an operator. Uh, so let's imagine that O has spin one, it has d degrees of freedom, somehow this thing has d plus two degrees of freedom. So we need to put conditions on the polarization vector capital Z to reduce the number of degrees of freedom um, back down to d. Um, and so first of all, uh, these um, uh, these vectors are, are going to be null. 
Um, but the conditions that we, the extra conditions that we need to impose um, to reduce the number of degrees of freedom from d plus 2 to d is, first of all, a transverseness condition. Um, and second of all, um, a gauge redundancy. So there's a gauge redundancy under shifting z by x. And all the formulas that we write will have to be consistent with this gauge redundancy. Um, and so now let me just write what the lift of this operator is. And you'll see that it indeed has um, all the desired properties. Okay, so the idea is that you start with this operator in flat space. Um, and um, uh, the lift to the embedding space is as follows. So it's capital X plus to the minus delta. Oh, and maybe to disambiguate um, things a little bit, um, I'll write EMB for embedding. Later, I'm just going to use the arguments um, of the operator to indicate whether I'm in the embedding space or not. So O of little x mu is equal to capital X mu over capital X plus, comma little z mu equals capital Z mu minus Z plus over X plus X mu. Okay, so as an exercise, um, you should check that um, this definition is consistent with this um, uh, gauge redundancy. Okay, so we've lifted our flat space operator to an operator on the embedding space that has some nice properties. First of all, um, it's homogeneous in both capital X and capital Z. And second of all, it's consistent with this gauge redundancy. Um, and the homogeneity property is that, um, so I'll write the gauge redundancy again. So O of X comma Z is equal to O of X comma Z plus beta X. And its homogeneity properties um, are by construction O of lambda x alpha z is lambda to the minus delta alpha to the j O of x comma z. Okay, so that's um, the lift to the embedding space. Um, and we can easily go back and forth from the embedding space to flat space. So let me write the dictionary in the other direction. So O of little x comma little z is just given by specializing the embedding space vector to the Poincaré section. Um, and we also have to specialize the polarization vector to a polarization vector version of the Poincaré section. Okay, um, And you should check for yourself that this is the inverse to the thing on the previous board. Okay, And then finally, the whole point of doing this is that it makes the transformation properties of these operators under conformal transformations very simple. If we have a conformal transformation um, labeled by uh, G, um, uh, then um, the coordinates of this thing just transform uh, in this way, where G acts uh, as a matrix on uh, capital X and capital Z. Okay. So by making this lift, we can now think about the linear action of the conformal group, and we don't have to uh, work hard thinking about this nonlinear action. Questions? Okay. Good. So um, now that we have our technology, let's apply it to understand uh, these null integrated operators. Um, and my claim is that the null integrated operators can be understood in terms of a conformally invariant integral transform that I'll call the light transform. Um, and its definition in the embedding space is very simple. So it's a one-dimensional integral. And given an embedding space operator O, um, it gives back an operator with embedding, spa with embedding space coordinates. 
And it's given by the following integral, O of z minus alpha x minus x. OK, so why, why on earth do we want to write this thing down? So first of all, um, we should check. Um, so uh, first of all, I claim that this is a conformally invariant integral transform. In the embedding space, that's completely trivial to see. It's because it only makes reference to these vectors, capital X and capital Z, which transform linearly under the conformal group. Okay, so the transformation properties of this thing are the same as the transformation properties of this thing. Okay, so it's conformally invariant. Uh, another non-trivial property is, it, is that it's consistent with the redundancy under shifting z. And the way it manages to do that is if you shift z in this way, then you can undo that shift by just making a change of variable on the uh, integration variable alpha. Okay? So you can shift alpha to compensate for this shift. So this is automatically gauge invariant. Um, and uh, um, and finally, we can check that it's homogeneous. So you can just read off its transformation properties under rescaling x and z from the transformation properties of O. And so you can, uh, you can check. This is an exercise. That it has this homogeneity. And together, all these properties imply that this thing is a primary operator um, with dimension. So compare this thing to that thing over there. The dimension is 1 minus j and spin 1 minus delta. OK, so it's a conformally invariant integral transform. It takes a local operator um, to some kind of non-local operator, but the non-local operator transforms in a really beautiful way under conformal transformations. It's still a primary. It just has these very funny quantum numbers. And let me mention an important consistency condition here. So the claim here is that L is a conformally invariant integral transform that, takes the that changes the quantum numbers in this way. Um, uh, an important consistency condition is that um, uh, the conformal Casimir eigenvalues should be invariant under this transformation. Right? If L is conformally invariant, it has to commute with the conformal Casimirs. Um, so let's write down the conformal Casimir. Um, and I, I, did Slava talk about the conformal Casimirs? Someone said that he did. OK, well, you can imagine what they are. <laughs> uh, they're Casimir operators built out of the generators of the conformal group, which is an orthogonal group. Okay? Um, and there's a, a, a quadratic and a quartic Casimir. And so, for example, the quadratic Casimir eigenvalue um, is a somewhat famous formula. Um, and there's a similar formula for the quartic Casimir eigenvalue. Um, and uh, you can check, I encourage you to check, that these quantities are, in fact, invariant under this transformation. And it's actually a little bit non-trivial. You need to do a little algebra. You can't just, like, well, maybe some of you can do it in your heads. Um, so, um, so good. Um, so a transformation that preserves the Casimirs, like this, um, is called an affine vial reflection. Um, and the light transform is uh, one element of a dihedral group um, of affine vial reflections um, of the, uh, uh, for the Lorentzian conformal group. Um, specifically, um, affine vial reflections 
that only mix um, uh, delta and j. And it's important that they only mix delta and j and not other weights of the conformal group because delta and j are the their own, the Lorentzian conformal group has two non-compact generators, um, two non-compact Cartan generators. And you're only allowed to consider transforms that mix up the weights conjugate to the non-compact generators. If that didn't make any sense, don't worry about it. We don't actually need that uh, later. But OK, so this L is one member of a dihedral group worth of integral transformations that uh, are conformally invariant in Lorentzian signature. And in particular, most of this dihedral group doesn't make uh, sense at all in Euclidean signature. You wouldn't have access to any of this structure. There's one element that does exist in Euclidean signature, which is the so-called shadow transform, which you might have heard of. OK, um, good. So uh, that's L. And its embedding space uh, expression is extremely simple. Um, but let's uh, um, go back down to Earth um, and try to write it uh, in a more conventional way. OK, so we're going to write L in Minkowski coordinates. Um, and for this, we can just use our dictionary for translating between uh, flat space and the embedding space. So the dictionary says that we should take our operator um, and restrict to the point gray section. So we're going to set x equal to 1, comma, little x squared, comma, little x, z equal to 0. 2z dot x comma z. Um, OK, and so let's do a little bit of manipulation before we do this. So first of all, we can use um, uh, gauge redundancy of O in its second argument um, to shift the second argument. So we can instead write this as z, z minus alpha x comma. So what I want to do is. Um, subtract 1 over alpha times the first argument. Um, and that gives us minus 1 over alpha times z. OK? So that was using uh, this property of O. OK? Um, and so now I can use homogeneity to pull out some factors um, of minus alpha. Okay, so it's homogeneous of degree minus delta in its first argument. So I get a minus alpha to the minus delta. Um, and it's also homogeneous of degree j in the second argument. So I get minus alpha uh, to the minus delta minus j. O of x minus capital Z over alpha comma z. where this thing is restricted to the Poincaré section. Um, and the nice thing about doing this is now this thing um, sits uh, on the Poincaré section. Um, and um, so uh, when we restrict this thing, um, it's very simple to write down what the restriction is um, in terms of flat, a flat space operator. This is just O of little x minus little z over alpha, comma, little z. OK, so let's look at what this does. Um, so first of all, it's an integral from minus infinity to infinity. So when alpha is equal to minus infinity, um, the operator O is sitting at the point x. So here's x. Um, and that's when alpha is minus infinity. Um, as alpha increases from minus infinity, x moves, the point where O sits, moves in the z direction. Um, now something funny happens when alpha hits 0. When alpha hits 0, the Minkowski coordinate here blows up. 
So O is moving along the null direction, and it gets out to null infinity. Um, and uh, you might worry that something bad is happening there, because we have this fractional power of alpha. You know, it's OK when alpha is negative, but when alpha becomes positive, like what's going to happen? Uh, we don't know. So, but this diagram makes it clear that we shouldn't worry. Um, so what, what happens when alpha equals 0 is that we're moving along this light-like trajectory, and we get to this point, alpha equals 0. But the point is that in a conformal field theory, null infinity is not a special place. Okay? There's nothing interesting happening there, unless, of course, there are other operators inserted in the correlator that happen to sit at null infinity. But let's assume that other operators are in generic positions. Okay? So there's nothing interesting here. There's no singularity in the correlator. And what that means is that this factor of minus alpha to the minus delta minus j will be canceled by, is necessarily canceled by singularities in correlation functions of this thing. Okay? So this isn't a special point. Um, so we can just keep going. Um, and the correct prescription is to keep going into the next Poincaré patch, or the next Minkowski patch. And we end up at this point Tp, or Tx. And another way to see that that's where we end up is to look at the embedding space coordinate for the operator. So when alpha is minus infinity, this is z minus minus infinity uh, times x. Um, but we're working projectively, so we can rescale things, right? And, and we, uh, we're working modular rescaling. So let's rescale this by a factor of infinity. And so this is equivalent to x. Okay, that's, a ju that's another way of saying that the operator starts at the point x. Um, and the endpoint is z minus plus infinity times x, which is equivalent under rescaling to minus x. Um, and I, I claimed earlier that um, the embedding coordinate for this next point, tx, is just minus the embedding coordinate for the original point. Okay. So um, that's good. It means that the integration contour, actually this is something I should have said earlier, the integration contour is a conformally invariant contour. And that's important for making this a conformally invariant transform. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Great. That's a great question. And actually, I'm going to address that now. So um, what do you do if you're sitting in Minkowski space? Well, there's only one way that you can fit this operator inside Minkowski space. Um, uh, the, the point x has to be at past null infinity. If you move the point x down to past null infinity, then the whole contour fits inside Minkowski space. So a Minkowski observer. Um, uh, has access to some properties of this operator, um, uh, but it, but uh, the observer doesn't quite see the whole structure because it can't, um, he or she can't move the operator the full way that the operator wants to be moved. So let me, um, uh, hmm, okay. Um, uh, let's see what happens if we, if we put the starting point at past null infinity. So what we can do is just choose um, a different, uh, some, some different embedding coordinates um, for the operator. Um, so here I'm writing uh, coordinates x plus, x minus, and then light cone coordinates for the other uh, coordinates. Okay, um, and uh, this is a point at past null infinity. Um, and if you want to check that for yourself, you can start at the origin, and um, uh, um, so the origin is the point zero one. Um, sorry, uh, one zero zero. 0, 0, and move from here in a null direction towards past null infinity, you'll have to rescale the embedding space vector um, to get a finite result, and you'll end up with this. Okay, so I'll leave that as an exercise. So I claim that this is, um, that's the embedding space coordinate for this point here. Okay? Um, and then we can make a different choice for z. 
Okay? Now, an important point is that these choices satisfy the conditions that x0 is null and z0 is null and x0 dot z0 is 0. And these conditions are necessary in order for this to be a sensible place to put the operator. Okay? So if I've satisfied these conditions, I can, as long as I satisfy these conditions, I can choose any embedding space vectors I want, and I'm going to choose these. Okay? Um, and so you choose these um, and uh, use the dictionary. Um, and uh, you'll find that this is exactly the light transform. Okay? So one of the central claims of this exercise is that this null integrated operator, um, we now know how it transforms under conformal transformations. Um, it transforms like a primary operator with non-integer spin um, associated with the point uh, x0 at past null infinity. Okay, And so as an example, um, the average null energy operator um, transforms like a primary with uh, dimension minus 1 and spin 1 minus d. OK? Is there a question? OK, good. So understanding the conformal transformation properties of these operators uh, is extremely useful for understanding their correlation functions. Okay. Um, and because this isn't a local operator, I just don't care if it has a funny dimension or something. That's right. So that's a good point. So it's not a local operator, so it doesn't have to satisfy the unitarity bounds for local operators. Um, and in fact, the correlation functions of this of these uh, non-integer spin things have some funny and interesting properties that uh, that we'll talk about. Um, and actually, your question is related to a uh, computation that I want to do uh, right now. Any other questions? Yeah. I know this thing is only the same for the writing in space, or for some extra data that has to be reached in the space. If it only depends on. So it, it definitely depends on a light ray and a base point. Um, so uh, um, once once you specify the light ray, uh, you have to say what the base point is. So uh, this operator here is different from this operator here, which has a different base point. OK. Um, so let's, um, let's talk about some of the properties of correlation functions of these operators. And for that, we're going to prove um, a useful lemma. Um, which is that um, the light transform of a local operator annihilates the vacuum. Okay, let me say, um, let me give a super, uh, super slick proof of this um, lemma that you guys are going to not really like, but it, it, it goes to your question. So the super slick proof is um, this is an operator with um, uh, dimension 1 minus j and spin 1 minus delta. If it did not annihilate the vacuum, it would create a state with dimension 1 minus j and spin 1 minus delta. And there's the state operator correspondence, which tells you that there would be a local operator with those quantum numbers, and that violates the unitarity bounds. OK, so who was satisfied with that? OK, someone was a couple of people satisfied. OK, now let's, now let's uh, prove it in a little bit uh, uh, more um, satisfying way. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is consider, um, uh, consider a Whiteman function, just a general correlation function, with an arbitrary insertion of a whole bunch of local operators, um, and then um, uh, the light transform of O acting on the vacuum. Um, 
Um, and we're going to show that this is equal to 0. Um, and if this is equal to 0, then it establishes that this is equal to 0 as a state. OK? Um, so what is this? It's the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Um, and we're going to. We're going to show this. Um, we're going to pick a convenient conformal frame for showing this. I'm going to pick um, uh, this conformal frame, okay? So that we can work in light cone coordinates and everything is nice and beautiful um, and uh, very hands on, okay? So we're going to have an integral dv of the correlation function of all of these insertions um, times O of u equals 0, vy, acting on the vacuum. OK, so um, all right. So uh, from the first lecture, or the beginning of the second lecture, we know that this Whiteman function is holomorphic um, for when the imaginary parts of the positions are ordered in a particular way. So in particular, the imaginary part of x1 is in the past of the imaginary part of x2, dot, dot, dot. Um, in the past of the imaginary part of this thing. Um, and we're going to take y to be real, but we're going to allow v to be complex Okay, in this argument. So the imaginary part um, of this uh, position is just 0, imaginary part of v, comma 0. Okay. So um, this is the regime of holomorphicity of the Whiteman function. And in fact, to evaluate the Whiteman function, we have to um, go to the boundary of the regime of holomorphicity from inside this region. OK? OK, so um, what that means is uh, if we plot the integrand here as a function of v, so we're integrating v from minus infinity to infinity, the claim is that um, it's holomorphic when the imaginary part of v is bigger than the imaginary part um, of all of these things. Um, and indeed, we're integrating this Whiteman function. So we have so the Whiteman function is defined by um, staying inside the region of holomorphicity. So it means the Whiteman function you know, could have singularities, but all the singularities have to be in the lower half plane for v. Okay? It's holomorphic in the upper half plane. Um, now, one can additionally uh, argue that this thing goes like um, v to the minus delta minus j as v goes to infinity. So it decays at infinity. And that means that um, if it decays sufficiently quickly at infinity, we can take this contour in the v plane and close it into the upper half plane and get 0. Yes? OK, so your question is, here we're not integrating against the Schwartz function. We're integrating against um, uh, um, something that's not a Schwartz function. Um, that's true, but uh, I claim that the integral converges anyway, because the correlator is well behaved at infinity. If the, in that case, you could, if you like, think of this integral as a limit of integrals against Schwartz functions, if you want. Other questions? Yeah. Correct. So uh, how do we know there isn't some super selection sector or something that satisfies those properties but isn't zero? Uh, OK, good. Um, so the question was, how do we know that there isn't a state um, that is not created out of the vacuum by local operators? Um, so first of all, um, in, a, uh, in a QFT on Minkowski space satisfying the Whiteman axioms, that is not possible because the Whiteman axioms include the statement that the space of states is spanned by the action of local operators. That I don't think it, that might be a not a very satisfying argument because who knows what kind of funky uh, construction people could cook up. Um, I think a better argument is to say that actually this works even if you have non-local insertions here. 
Okay, so even if you have non-local insertions, if you wanted to define a Whiteman distribution in the presence of those non-local insertions, you would still have to start in the regime of holomorphicity, go to the boundary of the regime of holomorphicity in the same way. Okay, so it's not actually important that these things be local. Okay, so um, uh, essentially, maybe, maybe a less fancy way to say this is just let's imagine giving V a small positive imaginary part. What does it do? What it does is it inserts here uh, e to the minus um, some uh, null component um, of the momentum uh, times the imaginary part of v. Okay, um, and this is a positive operator. Okay, so it makes the correlator holomorphic, and it doesn't matter what's here. Um, good. Okay, so um, this means that um, uh, this means in particular that these funny non-integer spin operators don't create states, and therefore don't have to satisfy the unitarity bounds, um, and so on. Now, as I said. Um, the knowledge of how these things transform under conformal transformations um, is very useful for constraining the correlation functions. Um, and uh, um, let me just give an example. So suppose that we start with a three-point function um, of an operator with, um, so let's say, two scalars and an operator with spin j. Um, Yes? Yes, that, that, that's right. So, so hopefully later we'll talk about continuous spin operators that are not light transforms of local operators. They also annihilate the vacuum. Um, and um, there are a few different ways to see that. Um, uh, but I, maybe, this, maybe the slick way is the easiest one, okay? the, the first argument that I gave. Okay, um, so uh, let's consider this thing. So one thing that maybe Slava mentioned is that a three-point function of two scalars and a spin j operator has a unique conformally invariant structure. Okay, and so what I mean by this expression is the unique conformally invariant structure for uh, a spin j operator and two scalars. Um, what happens if we take the light transform? Well, first of all, um, this question only makes sense if we light transform um, the operator in the middle. Because the light, transform kills, the light transform kills the vacuum, so if we light transformed either of these two other guys, we would get zero, and it wouldn't be very interesting. So let's do this one. Um, uh, because it's a conformally invariant transform, um, it has to give you something that transforms like a three-point function of phi 1, phi 2, and something with, the, with these shifted or with these reflected quantum numbers. But there is a unique three-point structure for two scalars and a spin something operator. So it tells you that this has to be proportional to that three-point structure. So it would look like, um, oh, schematically, 1 minus j, 1 minus delta um, phi 2, with some constant of proportionality um, that you can figure out as an exercise. Okay, so that's an example of the kind of um, thing that uh, that this gives you, and we'll use this reasoning again in a second. Okay. Um, good. So now I want to talk about um, uh, again one of the most important examples of this uh, type of operator, which is the average null energy operator. Um, and the average null energy condition. Um, so the average null energy condition says that the light transform of the stress tensor is a positive operator. By which I mean that its expectation value in any state is positive. Um, 
And um, there are two recent proofs of the null energy condition. Um, one using information theory um, that Tom Faulkner may have told you about. Um, and another using causality that Tom Hartman probably didn't tell you about, but he could have. Um, and, um, but uh, I want to go back to the um, uh, original motivation for suggesting that this condition should be true uh, in conformal field theory, um, which uh, comes from a, a thought experiment due to Hoffman and Malasena. Um, so uh, their idea was to consider a conformal collider event. So here's Minkowski space. Um, and let's imagine some kind of um, explosion near the origin, um, by which technically I mean, say, the insertion of an operator that creates a non-trivial state. Um, so uh, this um, uh, operator insertion creates excitations that move out to null infinity. And you could imagine um, having a calorimeter uh, that, that measures energy deposited in the calorimeter um, and have it, well, let me start with it a little bit closer, um, and integrate the energy deposited in the calorimeter over time as the calorimeter moves up to future infinity. Um, and um, uh, so this type of experiment happens every day at the Large Hadron Collider. And usually, they find that the energy is positive. Um, so it's reasonable to expect that it should be positive. Okay? Um, and specifically, we're going to be interested in taking a limit where the calorimeter um, is very far from the event. Um, and that corresponds to the calorimeter moving along trajectories that go closer and closer to null infinity. So you can see that in the limit where the calor calorimeter goes very far away from the event, um, it's moving along null infinity. Um, so let's see. So let's derive that the ANIC operator is the thing that you get. The average null energy condition is so famous that um, the operator it applies to is called a condition. I uh, keep calling it the ANIC operator instead of the ANA operator. OK. Um, so uh, uh, more explicitly, our calorimeter um, is going to be labeled by a point on the d minus 2 sphere. So this is the, um, this is the direction uh, that the, this, is, this is the angular direction that the calorimeter sits at. And it's going to label the point on the celestial sphere where the calorimeter ends up. Um, and we're going to take a limit as r goes to infinity, um, r to the d minus 2, and then an integral over time of the flux of energy um, uh, in the radial direction. Okay? So the flux of energy in the radial direction um, is given by uh, contracting this unit operator, uh, this unit vector with t0i. We're evaluating it at time t and position r times n. OK, so that's the definition of, of our detector. Um, and um, OK, so. Uh, let's um, uh, let's relate this to um, the uh, formalism that we developed before. Okay, so the first comment is an exercise, um, which is to convince yourself that this um, product of unit vector um, times uh, t zero i can be written as one fourth z mu z nu minus z bar mu z bar nu times t mu nu, um, where z mu is 1 comma minus n, and z bar mu is 1 comma n. Okay. The point of doing this is I want to write 
the stress sensor insertion in terms of some null polarization vectors. And remember, I claimed that we could always go back and forth between the operator contracted with null polarization vectors and the underlying tensor. So we know that this should be possible. And indeed, you can just check for yourself that this is a way to do it. OK? Um, and uh, the other comment is that when we take the r to infinity limit, this part is actually not going to matter. We will actually check that. So as r goes to infinity, we can ignore this part. And we really just get a null component of the stress sensor. OK. Um, so uh, let's write this in the embedding space then. So this is 1 quarter limit as r goes to infinity, r to the d minus 2, integral from 0 to infinity dt, t of capital X, comma, to capital, comma, capital Z, where capital X is on the Poincaré section. Um, and in this case, it's just equal to 1, r squared minus t squared t r times n. Um, and capital Z is the Poincaré section version of a polarization vector, 2x dot z comma z. And explicitly, that's 0 minus 2 r plus t, 1 minus n. OK, so um, we'd like to take a limit as r goes to infinity of this thing. And the only thing that we have to do is just track what happens to these embedding space vectors. Um, and a nice thing about writing things in, the, in terms of the embedding space is it makes totally clear how things scale as r goes to infinity. So we'll see very clearly why we need exactly this factor. OK, um, but uh, we need to do something slightly tricky, um, which is to note that if we sit at fixed time and take the limit r to infinity, um, we end up at an uninteresting place. We end up at um, spatial infinity. So um, that's not good, because the integral goes all the way along null infinity. So we can't just take the r goes to infinity limit at fixed t. Instead, we need to rewrite t in terms of so-called retarded time. So I'll write t is equal to r plus alpha, um, and write everything in terms of alpha. OK, so what do we get? We just plug in uh, t equals r plus alpha into those expressions. 1 r squared minus r plus alpha squared r plus alpha rn. Um, and you can see that in the large, in the limit of r, large r, this becomes r 0 minus 2 alpha 1 n. Um, and similarly for z, 0 minus 2, 2r plus alpha, 1 minus n. And this becomes minus 4r, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so now let me define a couple uh, useful um, reference points. So the first one is the point at infinity, which has embedding space vector 0, 1, 0. Okay, so this is the limit as x goes to infinity in a spatial direction of 1 x squared x, right? Modular rescaling. Um, and the other reference vector is a polarization vector, 0, 0, z. Um, and so we see that uh, this thing becomes um, little r times z infinity minus 2 alpha x infinity. And this thing becomes minus 4r x infinity. OK, and so exercise check that the z bar terms vanish faster. As r goes to infinity. Uh, using this formalism. OK. And so maybe some of you can see where we're going already. 
Nice. So what we find, e of n is 1 quarter, limit as r goes to infinity, r to the d minus 2, integral over retarded time, so minus r to infinity, d alpha, r to the minus d. So here what I'm going to do is use the homogeneity properties of t. Okay? So we have t evaluated at these two vectors. But t has homogeneity minus d in its first, uh, first component and um, uh, 2 in its second component, because it's been 2. So we can pull out those factors of r and 4r. And we get t of z infinity minus 2 alpha x infinity minus x infinity. Um, now the r's cancel. Um, because we're taking a limit, r goes to infinity. Um, this integral over alpha goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, and then finally, we can make a change of variables. Alpha, or 2 alpha, goes to alpha. And you end up with 2 times the light transform of t at x infinity comma z infinity. OK? So what's happened is what you might expect from the picture. We end up with uh, the light transform of the stress tensor um, at the point spatial infinity. What that means is that the starting point for the light transform is spatial infinity. And then it moves along some null direction and ends up uh, at time like infinity. So uh, the conclusion is that this um, light transform of the stress sensor has a physical interpretation as the total energy deposited in a calorimeter. And therefore, we reasonably expect it to be positive. Um, now, the actual, uh, the rigorous proofs of the average null energy condition are a bit more involved. And hopefully, I'll have time to sketch one of them for you uh, tomorrow. Um, but now I want to. Um, just give you a sense of the kinds of things that you can get um, from this uh, condition. And um, this will tie back nicely into some of the stuff that we've already done. Okay? So we're going to, um, we're going to study the condition that the light transform um, of the stress sensor is a positive operator. Um, and let's do it in this kinematics. So we're going to put the light transform of the stress sensor um, here. So it starts at spatial infinity, runs along null infinity to future infinity. Um, so let's study a matrix element um, between primary operators. OK. Um, now, um, by the way, this, this notation here is just another way of writing this. So I'm just going to abbreviate it like this, L of t of infinity comma little z. OK. Now, um, we know how L of t transforms under conformal transformations, and we can use this to constrain this matrix element. And the key point is that L of t is a primary operator, and it's a primary at infinity. And primary operators at infinity are killed by translation generators. So this is just the, so you're hopefully familiar with the statement that primary operators at the origin are killed by special conformal transformations. And a special conformal transformation um, uh, um, uh, around infinity is just a translation. Okay, so this is 0. Um, because L of t is primary. It's primary because we wrote it in terms of this conformally invariant integral transform. That's one way to see it. 
can see it in um, other ways, of course. Um, sorry, and this is a little j. OK, so what does that mean? It means that this matrix element um, is uh, translation invariant. So I can write it like this. OK, now suppose we want to study positivity of this operator. What does that mean? It means that um, uh, it means that this thing is positive um, when inserted between any states. Um, and we can generate states by smearing local operators against test functions. So positivity of L of t is equivalent to the statement that this is a positive definite integral kernel. Okay. Okay. Um, does this situation look familiar to anyone? So what's the next step? Fourier transform, right? Okay, it's, we, we want it to be a positive definite integral kernel. Uh, because it's translationally invariant, it's partially diagonalized by going to Fourier space. So this is equivalent to the condition that um, Kij tilde of P is a positive matrix valued tempered distribution. Okay, And that's a lot of scary words, but they should hopefully be not so scary because we encountered exactly this situation in the Lorenzian proof of the unitarity bounds. OK, so, um, uh, so great. So this is a much simpler situation. We now just have to check positivity of this Fourier transform. Now, it's a little, di a little bit different from um, the Lorenzian proof of the unitarity bounds, because in the case of the unitarity bounds, um, we had this nice property that two-point functions uh, between uh, primary operators, between different primary operators, are 0. So the two-point function is diagonal. Um, and that meant that um, it was not so hard to write down necessary and sufficient conditions for unitarity. Here, um, this matrix element is not necessarily diagonal. So we get interesting matrix elements uh, if we, even if we choose different uh, operators here for OI and OJ. Um, and so that means it's um, somewhat difficult to characterize sufficient conditions for positivity because we would have to study positivity of an infinite dimensional matrix where the indices of the matrix run over all the primary operators of the theory. But you can write down necessary uh, conditions for positivity by studying small submatrices of this infinite dimensional matrix, which is a fancy way of just saying we can restrict to our favorite choices of operators here and demand that we still get a positive definite matrix with those choices. Um, and so uh, one of the most important choices um, is the case where OI and OJ are themselves both stress tensors. So, and let's consider that case. So, what that means is that we have to study positivity of the Fourier transform. Um, and now the indices of this kernel are going to be the spin indices of the stress tensor. So, this is equal to this matrix element. Okay, um, and so let's figure out what this thing is. Um, so the first comment is that um, it has support uh, inside the future null cone um, by positivity of energy. The argument for that is the same as the argument in the case of a two-point function. So what that means is that we can um, use Lorentz transformations to set p to our favorite um, future pointing vector, and we're going to set p equal to p naught comma 0, 0, dot, dot, dot. Um, now, uh, this thing is a homogeneous function of z. 
right? It has homogeneity 1 minus d in z. That comes from the fact that this thing has spin 1 minus d. Um, and therefore, we can, we're free to rescale z to whatever we want. And we can, we can undo the rescaling at the end. Okay, so let's set z equal to 1 comma n for some unit vector. Actually, maybe I used a different, yeah. So we can just set it to 1 comma minus n. It doesn't matter. Um, and um, OK, another comment is that uh, we know the scaling dimension of this thing. You can just read off. You, we know the scaling dimension of the stress tensor. We know that the Fourier transform involves an integral over space, so that decreases the scaling dimension by d. This has a fixed scaling dimension. So that means we actually know what the powers of p naught are. So we get, we're free to set p naught equal to 1, if we like. And then we can restore it later by dimensional analysis. Um, and then the final point is, uh, is, um, is an interesting one, which is that the stress tensor is conserved, which in momentum space is this very simple statement. Um, and that implies that um, k tilde is only non-zero if the indices are space-like. Okay, and um, so now what do we need to do? We need to, after making all these specializations, we have to study k tilde with space-like indices. These indices should be traceless and symmetric. Um, and the only object that we have to build things with is n. Um, so we can just try to write down um, all the possibilities. Um, and um, uh, so one possible term is delta ik, delta jl, plus delta I L delta J K over two um, minus traces. Okay, that one doesn't involve any any uh, insertions of N. We could also have something like something uh, with two insertions of N, so something like delta I K uh, N J N L. Um, we have to symmetrize Uh, and subtract traces appropriately. And then finally, we could have a term with four n's in it. Um, and that's it. So there are three possible things that we can write down consistent with symmetries. Um, and uh, the fact that there are three possible structures um, is just a reflection of the fact that there are three possible conformally invariant conserved three-point structures for a three-point function of stress tensors. Okay? So I don't know if Slava talked about three-point functions in a CFT, but you can start um, by just using conformal invariance to restrict the form of the three-point structures. In general, um, there'll be a finite number of possible structures. And then you can impose conservation, and that will reduce the number of possible structures further. Um, and so for each type of operator, there's some counting of possible three-point structures. And in the case of stress tensors, there are three structures um, in generic dimensions. Um, and one of them is uh, fixed by ward identities. Specifically, the ward identity is the condition that if I take a stress tensor and I integrate it over a um, d minus one dimensional surface, a co-dimension one surface, then I should get the conformal charges. Okay? So I know what the integral of the stress tensor over a co-dimension one surface should be. And that allows you to fix one of the uh, possible coefficients of these three structures. And then there are two remaining. And if you like, you can take these to be t2 and t4. Um, now, the exact relationship between t2 and t4 and your favorite formalism for counting conformal three-point structures is something that you can only figure out by actually doing the computation, um, which is something that I don't have the honesty to do right now in front of you guys. But, um, but, uh, but you do the light transform and the Fourier transform. Um, starting from this, and you'll end up with this. This is the only thing allowed by symmetries. Um, 
And so now we can impose that this thing is a positive definite uh, bilinear form. And that gives constraints on T2 and T4. Um, and these are the famous hoffman maldacena bounds. And I'll write them for you in four dimensions. So for example, when d equals 4, um, you get bounds like 1 minus t2 over 3 minus 2 t2 t4 over 15 is bigger than or equal to 0. And there are two other bounds, which you can look at the notes for. Um, and uh, these OPE coefficients um, are related, in four dimensions, um, they're related to uh, anomaly coefficients. So it turns out that T2 and T4 are related to the anomaly coefficients A and C. And so one result of this analysis is a bound on A and C. which involves a 31. And I'm curious um, if uh, when um, Juan and Diego first saw the 31, they thought maybe they uh, made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, that's usually good. If you see a 31, you should check yourself carefully. But uh, that is, in, in fact, the correct answer. Um, and um, so you get bounds on anomaly coefficients. And this is very interesting because these anomaly coefficients enter in many different ways. Um, for example, um, uh, a uh, appears in uh, a monotonicity theorem for RG flows, and that immediately tells you something about how C can behave under RG flows. Um, and uh, if you're interested in studying the space of quantum field theories or conformal field theories, then this is a, a, an important constraint. And there are an infinite number of constraints like this that come out of the average null energy condition. Um, and actually, the recent proof, the recent proofs of the ANIC have spurred some um, some work in this area. So people have been studying. Um, uh, essentially, larger submatrices of this object, um, and getting um, uh, um, getting more bounds on CFT data. So, in addition to bounds on OP coefficients, um, another thing that comes out of this is, are, um, uh, in some cases, improvements on the usual unitarity bounds. So, um, this uh, this condition actually contains the unitarity bounds in a very nice way, um, which is that, so here we're looking at positivity of the ANIC operator at, at null infinity with a particular direction. So this z uh, encodes a direction on the celestial sphere. If you take um, that direction on the celestial sphere and you average over the celestial sphere, um, then uh, this, the average of L of t just turns into the total energy. But since we're working in Fourier space, the total energy is just a factor of p naught. So it means that um, uh, if you average over directions on the celestial sphere, you land on positivity of the Fourier transform of the two-point function, which is the unitarity bound. Okay? So this manifestly is an improvement on the unitarity bounds. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a strict improvement and sometimes it's not. Um, and actually, at this point, I think it's an open question what the general improved unitarity bounds from the ANIC uh, are. Um, OK, so I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, that's a good question. So the question was why you don't have to worry about null p. Um, and um, let's see. So uh, um, uh, whether or not this thing has support at null p depends on the operators that you're studying. Um, if, uh, in particular, in their operator dimensions. Um, if you're in a free theory, then I think it will have support at null p. Um, it, it, it's, a con it's a concrete computation you can do. You can start with a three-point function with various scaling dimensions, do the Fourier transform, and see if you get something that goes to zero at the null cone or, it, or gives you some non-trivial distributional piece on the null cone. I think in a free theory, you'll get a non-trivial distributional piece on the null cone. 
um, because energy moves along the null directions in a free theory. Um, but in general, you won't. In an interacting theory, you won't. Other questions? Yeah. OK, that's, a, that's a, a great question. So the question was, if I take an OPE of two integer spin operators, um, should I expect to find something of continuous spin or not? Um, and uh, this more closely relates to what we'll talk about next time. Um, but the idea is that the, um, there's a usual version of the OPE. The usual version of the OPE is that you have two local operators, you OPE them, and you get local operators. Um, that usual version of the OPE um, uh, has some regime of convergence. Um, okay, so it's only, you can only apply it in certain uh, kinematic situations. Depends on where the other operator insertions are. Um, uh, in Lorentzian signature, that statement is actually a little bit different. Maybe I'll make a comment here about that. So um, the important thing for convergence of the OPE is the Euclidean positions of the operators. So you may be familiar, maybe Slava talked about this. The OPE converges in Euclidean space if you can draw a sphere such that two operators are inside the sphere and everything else is outside. So that's a statement about Euclidean separation. It's that there's some Euclidean separation between the two operators that you're trying to OPE and everything else. You can evolve by a little bit in radial quantization, radial time, before you get there. So it's the Euclidean positions that's important for the OPE. And in Lorenzian signature, the Euclidean positions um, are the I epsilon prescriptions. So in a Lorenzian signature, the important thing for convergence of the OPE is the I epsilon prescription and nothing else. Um, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but um, essentially the condition for convergence of the OPE and Lorenzian signature um, uh, let, me, let me do it like this. Um, the condition for convergence of the OPE is that the two operators have to be separated in Euclidean time from the other operators, which means they have to be next to each other and next to the vacuum and all the other operators somewhere else. So you can do the OPE if the two operators act on the vacuum. That's the condition in Lorenzian signature. Um, and so now you can ask, what happens if you try to do some kind of OPE when the two operators do not act on the vacuum? So you're outside of the regime of convergence of the usual OPE, and you can ask, what appears? And the general answer is not known. Um, but it is known in, um, I guess, basically one special kinematic uh, circumstance, which is the one we'll talk about next time, which is um, uh, this Reggie regime. So in the Reggie regime, what happens is that, um, uh, indeed, you find continuous spin operators in the generalized version of the OPE.